tricked me. I thought it was real. You got everything? Man of the Spirit is given to every man 
to profit with all. And then the verse that is listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit, which we covered last week. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. A minister once said that healing is faith for the body as salvation is faith for the soul. When we look at the gifts of the Spirit, there's something completely different about this gift versus every other one of them. And that is the fact that when we look at the gifts of healing, it's not singular. We can look at the gift of faith, singular. The gift of tongues, singular. Uh, the gift of prophecy, singular. They go on and on. But out of all the nine gifts, this is the only gift that is mentioned in a plural form. It is the gifts of healing. Why would it be mentioned in just plural form? And let me back up here a second. When we look at this gift, it is mentioned three times in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll go ahead and read those. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've already read verse 9 where it said the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. If we go to verse 28. And God has set some of the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing. Notice it is in the singular form once again. Uh, plural form, I'm sorry, plural. And then in verse 30, have all the gifts of healing, once again, plural form. Do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. So this gift is mentioned three times within 1 Corinthians chapter 12 itself. So why do you think that this gift would be mentioned in the plural form? Why wouldn't it be singular? Why would it be rendered gifts of healing? somebody with the toothache? Is that the same as somebody who fell down the steps and broke their leg? No, they're different. They both need healing, but they're two different forms of healing. One person has an aching and a pain, and the other one literally has a physical broken body, but yet they both need a healing touch. There are different forms of sicknesses, there's different forms of diseases, and therefore, there are different forms of healing. So we have this gift that's not singular, but it's plural because God knew in his infinite wisdom that there's not just one type of healing, but there's multiple types of healing. If you have faith to believe something, you have faith to believe something else. If you have the gift of tongues, you can give the tongues here, you can give the tongues here. If you can prophesy or interpret, you can use that gift over here or over there. It doesn't change that whole much. You're bringing forth a word. You're bringing forth interpretation. But when it comes to healing, there are different types of healings that are needed. And we all know that our God is not a general God. He doesn't just slap a band-aid on something that says, what works for one will work for everything. But he knows that our bodies are different. There are different types of pains. There are different types of aches. There are different types of broken bones. Some are fractured, but some might be completely broken. And some limbs might be completely missing. But they all need healing. 
So perhaps the reason there are that this gift is in the plural form is because that God knew that there would be different types of healings needed. When we get into the um, argument about miracles and healings, sometimes people try and make a big distinction over the two. Some will say that healings, why they occur gradually, while miracles happen instantaneously. While others might claim that miracles happen outside the body and healings happen only within the body. So their argument is that if you have a tumor or cancer on the inside of your body, that's a healing. But if you had a boil or something maybe on the outside of your body, that would be a miracle. People try to make all kinds of distinctions. But what does scripture really say when our state when it comes down to it? The Greek word for healing is aima, and it means a cure, or the effect of healing. Scripture records healings and half, healings happening, happening both instantaneous. If someone would please read Luke chapter 8, verse 47. Luke 8, 47. While they're getting that, if someone else would get Matthew chapter 8, verse 13. Matthew 8 and 13. I'll get Luke. So what does Luke chapter 8 and verse 47 state? When the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, and declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. So here we have the woman with the issue of blood. Did she need a healing? Absolutely. Did Where was her healing? Was it outside or within her body? It was inside her body. But does scripture state that she went home and over time it finally got better and better and better? No. It says instantaneously she was healed. So some healings happen instantaneously. And some occur over a period of time. Would someone please read Matthew chapter 8 and verse 13. And she that said unto me, and she went out of the way, and thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. So, so how thou believe, so shall it be done unto thee. Luke chapter 17 and 12 through 14. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when they saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were not there ten cleansed? But where are the nine? And they are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith had made thee whole. So when we look here, it's almost as if we see both kinds of healings happening within this passage. The Bible states that as they went, they were healed. It didn't happen immediately, but as they were traveling. Now, was it that it was instantaneously that as they were traveling, that they obeyed God, started walking, and then all of a sudden, Brother Eli just all came upon them, and they were healed of the leprosy? Or maybe the farther the closer they got towards the high priest, the more and more it went away. One thing we do know is that all that cured was the leprosy. But when we look at this passage, the Samaritan had a miraculous, instantaneous, healing at the same time. Amen. Because God said, thy faith had made thee whole. Yeah. And what's that? It's not just a matter of curing the disease, but everything that he lost, whether they were fingers, noses, noses, hopefully he didn't have noses, a nose, toes, legs, limbs, it didn't matter. His leprosy was cured, but instantaneously, all his limbs were revived. 
They were brought back forth, whatever he did. So healings can be uh, instantaneous, or they can be progressive. I know myself, the one time I got prayed for, for um, my sciatica, it was instantaneous and both progressive in the fact that I knew that God healed me right then and there, but it occurred over several days. And it happened about three days, and finally on day three, all the pain was completely gone. But it went in steps. Healing is instantaneous sometimes, and sometimes is progressive. It takes a while. But we're looking here at comparing healings and miracles. And miracles, according to the Word of God, the Greek word that is used is dunamis. And that's that word that we hear all the time when the pastor is preaching. And we know that when he's referring to the Holy Ghost, it means power. So healing, the Greek word tells us that it means a cure, while miracles itself refers to power. It is forceful, miraculously powerful. It can be mighty. Now, a, the word miracle can also be used in general to refer to as a healing, as confusing as that can be. God may refer to it in the scripture as a healing being a miracle. Because it happened powerfully. It happened instantaneously. Now, it's not going to sit down and describe the miracle. It's not going to define the miracle. But it will refer to the miracle. Just like you can say, up there, Sister Beth and Brother Justin. Or you can refer to us in general and say, there they are. So we're looking at the same concept here. So in short, healings always seem to refer to the human body and can occur, can occur instantaneously or over a period of time or at the same time. At the same time, it can be referred to as a miracle. However, miracles may refer to healings of the human body, but more times than not, when we look at the Word of God, they are referring to something that is completely apart from a miracle. Maybe somebody rising from the dead. However, we also got to keep in mind that there are some quote-unquote sicknesses that aren't always physical. And what do I mean by that? Someone may have a toothache, and that's physical. We've already talked about that being one form of healing, or needing a form of healing. Somebody may have a broken bone. But there are some people that are just plain nuts and messed up up here. And I say that jokingly, but at the same time, we all know it's true. What does James chapter 5, verse 13 say? James 5.13. Is that James 5.13? If anybody will afflict him, let him pray. If any marry, let him sing song. Yes, yes, that's the word. What's that word there, Mom? If any are afflicted. Are all afflictions physical? Could we say that in the Garden of Gethsemane that Christ was afflicted? He was in conflict. He was in a struggle. He was in a battle. Some people are in a battle. And as Christians, sometimes we can get some aspects of the mind under control, and sometimes we can't. And I am not preaching or teaching mind over matter. If, you're if you stub your big toe and it hurts, you can't go around saying that your big toe doesn't hurt, but it really does hurt. I'm talking about the devil comes against us. And nine times out of ten, he's probably not coming against this physical flesh. He's not coming to grant smallpox upon somebody or give them a disease or make them sick. But nine times out of ten, when the devil's attacking us, he attacks us in our mind. 
And there are people that if they aren't careful, they can get caught up in the voice of the devil and start believing it. And when they do, they find themselves in a place of bondage, a place of affliction, and they need deliverance. When we look at James chapter 5, verse 13, it actually is referring to a hardship or trouble. And sometimes it's not even just mentally the devil attacking us. Sometimes, you know, unfortunately, life doesn't always go the best for us, some of us. And what do we say when it comes to trouble? When something big goes, something else big is about to go, and then we're going to be in financial hardship because that's just the way life goes. When something big goes, something else big is going to go. And we refer to it as a money rack. Now, if we're not careful, and if we don't have our trust in God, that in itself could become a hardship for us because we're not placing our trust in God. But God is there to deliver us from all our, to give us all the healings we need, whether physical or mental. He's there to aid us in all of our afflictions and our sicknesses. And sometimes, just sometimes, the affliction is both physical and both financial and both social at the same time. And mental. What do I mean by that? When we think about affliction, who do we think of in the Bible? We think of Job. Could we say that he was in a state of needing healing? Is it, was it just a healing physically? No, but it, he was in hardship. He was being afflicted mentally as well. His friends are trying to be him and tell him to give up on God. His wife is telling him to curse God and die. He has these boils which are painful. He lost all his money. He lost his family, his sons and his daughters, which if you think about the love that Job had for his children, it was great. I mean, he was out there day in and day out, not just spending money on the sacrifice, but earnestly sacrificing in case they would sin that day. He was doing everything he could to make sure that they were going to end up with God one of these days. And he got afflicted. So when we look at healings, it's not just physical, but sometimes it's a mental healing as well. Why do we need healing in the first place? Can anyone tell me what happened that caused us to need healing in the first place? Sin. sin. And if we talk about sin, we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 and 19. And we're not going to read all that for the sake of time. But that is the origin of sin. And when we look at sin and what happened, it wasn't just sin itself. God told Adam and Eve not to do something. And we all know that to do the opposite of what God says to do is disobedience. And that is sin. That is sin. But when Adam and Eve sinned, something happened. We know that death entered into the world. And if we look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9 through 19, just a quick rundown, God's having a conversation. And here, for the first time in human history, we have the blame game going on. God goes to Adam. Well, the woman, she gave it to me. It's not my fault. And then we go to the woman. It was the serpent fault. He tempted me. He tricked me. And then God came to the serpent. And when he came to the serpent, he had no place to look. He had no place to go. And God said, you know better. You've already been judged a long time ago, and you know better than this. And because of this, <laughs> now you're going to have to lick up the dust of the earth for all eternity. And then he talks, and I might be getting out of work, but he talks to the woman. And he tells her because she disobeyed, whether she was strict or not, it didn't matter. She did not listen to God. But because she disobeyed, 
she was going to experience pain unlike her counterpart, the male, would throughout her lifetime. Ch childbearing would be painful, and so on and so on. Also, before this, woman was equal with man. And I'm not trying to push down and uh, uh, preach a sexist gospel, but before this, she co-reigned with man in the garden. If she, it's not like God divided up the animals and said he was over this and Adam was over this. They did everything together. But because she was deceived, now she becomes the weaker vessel. And then God goes on and gives talks to Adam. And he says, because you listened to your wife, because you disobeyed, now you're going to have to work for your food. And because they both sinned, we know that death came upon the body. A cursing came upon his body. Mankind, we were supposed to live forever. We were in the world. The human body was not designed to die. It was designed to live forever with God in a perfect state because we know that what does Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2 state over and over and over when it talks about the days of creation? At the end of day one, God did this and he looked back and saw that it was, it was good. If the man would have been created to die, it would not have been good. Because God does everything perfectly. But because man died, this body, he said, would return to the earth. Its natural state was reversed. Where it was once designed to live for eternity, now the clock went backwards and it was going to return to the dust of the earth one of these days. And that earth, which it ruled, which this body ruled over, which Adam and Eve ruled over, will once again rule over their bodies in the end. Because their body would go back to the ground. And when we look at sickness, and when we look at death, so many times we say that Adam and Eve brought it upon them. Sin brought death into the world. What you did? But who brought sickness into the world? Who created sickness? What does Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1 say? Hosea 6 and 1. So what does the Bible state that he has done? What was the very first thing he did, Brother Dennis? He has torn. He has torn us. He has made our bodies to go back to the dust. He has created sickness. He's allowed them to be inflicted. But what does it say, Brother Dennis, after that? He has torn us, but he will heal us. But he will heal us. But there is a stipulation there. What is that very first phrase that you read there, Brother Dennis? Um, let us return unto the Lord. Let come, let us return unto the Lord. So there are several things going on in this verse. First of all, we see that God is the author of sickness. He is the one that allowed it to come on to man. But, even though that was part of the curse because of sin, this gift of healing, or gifts of healing, is God's way of partly giving back to man what was lost in the garden. He has torn us, but he will heal us. But there is a stipulation there. So many times people come for healing. So many times we come up and we go by that verse, um, call and let the elders lay hands on you and pray for you. But there is still a stipulation there. And it comes back to the very first phrase, of Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. We need to make sure that there is no sin in our life if we're going to expect us to heal us. Because the Bible says that he has torn us. Torn, punishment, sickness, disease. 
but he will heal us. But the stipulation is if we return unto him. So when we look at healing, it contains the exact same formula that salvation does. I mean, we talk about salvation. We can sit down and go through it without a shadow of doubt tell people how to be saved. You know, you need to come, you need to confess your sins, know that he is Lord, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and accept him as your personal Savior. But when it comes to healing, so many times we might stumble around and say, well, did you do this? And maybe it's not God's will, or did you do this? But there's that stipulation that we miss so many times in Hosea 6.1. Have we come before the Lord? Have we made sure that there is no sin in our life? Because sometimes there are things that creep into our own life that we don't even realize are there in the first place. What does the Bible state about our heart? It is deceitful. It is deceitfully wicked. And does the Bible say that only you can know it? Almost like only you can prevent forest fires. No. There's only one that knows it, and it's not you. God is the only one who is the seeker and the discerner of the intent of our hearts. And sometimes our own hearts fool us. So we need to find ourselves in a place at the altar and say, God, if there's any sin in my life, reveal it to me that I may be perfect in your sight. Because so many times we come before God with healing and say, I don't feel good. I need you to heal this. Or, uh, God, this tooth hurts me. I need you to take away the pain. But if we would relate that to salvation, that's the same thing as coming to the altar and saying, God, you're dealing with me because I have sinned in my life. I don't feel good. Make it right again. We're not addressing the situation. We're not addressing the problem. Healing, we need to make sure that there is everything in our life and in our heart that is right for God. We need to make sure that we are asking for repentance and then asking for our healing. Like I said, sometimes things creep in our life and we're not aware of it. That why, that's the other reason we need to be careful what we allow to come into our house. I know even Sister Beth and I, she likes sometimes those artifacts, I, I call them artifacts right now, but sculptures and stuff from other countries. We have a giraffe in our house, we have an elephant in our house, but you know, we're not about to bring a mask into our house. I don't care what the mask looks like, if it's cool or you don't know what that mask is used for. You don't know that fact. Is designed, is designed to attract evil spirits during a dance, or what? Some of those heathen tribes, when they're dancing in a circle, it's not out of enjoyment. They're trying to invoke the spirit to come. And they'll go through their rituals. Maybe they'll have a statue of a person to do the same. We need to be careful what we allow to come into our home. Sometimes we do things through ignorance. And it is sin. It's troubling. And it's allowing the devil to come into our lives. Even if we do it through ignorance, we need to be careful that everything we do is not just lined up with the Word of God, but we need to be careful in every area of our life. Peter told us that. He said, be uh, watchful, be careful, be diligent, because your adversary is a roaring lion cometh around seeking whom he may devour. He said, be careful, be watchful, because... He's going to come sneakily and slyful as that old serpent did. He may look beautiful on the outside, and he might have enticing words, but that doesn't mean that what he has to uh, sell you is good. So why may sickness and disease come into our bodies? You know, some people may be sick their entire life and have to struggle with it. Other people, you know, they may be perfectly healthy until the day they're about to die, and then they start getting sick. Why is that? It could be just how their body is. We know that all of us are cursed because of sin. We're all, for the moment we've been born, we are dying. So why do people get sick? First of all, it's part of the curse. But sometimes, just sometimes, God will allow the enemy to come in and test us. We talked about Job already this morning. The enemy came in, took everything from Job, took his health, took his family, left his wife to nag him. 
But what was the whole point of Job, of God allowing the enemy to cause all that to come upon Job? Was it because Job did something wrong and wasn't aware of it? No. No. It was to prove his innocence. So sometimes God will allow the enemy to afflict us to prove our innocence. And then there's another point where sometimes we're not living right. We're opening ourselves up and God says, all right, devil, have at it. So sometimes people get sick because of the curse of sin. Other times it's he allows the enemy to come in to cause sickness in our life to prove either our innocence or guilt. And you realize that sometimes we can bring sickness on our own bodies too. We can sit there and cry and cry and cry. God, why are you allowing me to have this pain? What did I do wrong? I've been doing everything you told me to do. When you just came from Golden Corral and you gorged yourself on steak and mashed potatoes and everything else, and you ate way more than you knew you should have. And maybe you sat <clears throat> and maybe you sat there for a half an hour till everything settled and went back for more. True story. I went out with some Bible school students to go and crowd my friends. They went for steak. They sat there and gorged themselves on steak. Sat there till everything settled for half an hour and then went back for more steak. Sometimes the reason we get sick is because we bring it upon ourselves. If we overeat when we know we're not supposed to and we get sick, we can cry to God all we want to heal our body. And maybe he will heal us. But if you go out to the golden corral and do the exact same thing again the next day, that's your own dumbness. You already know that you shouldn't overeat, and you know it's going to make you sick. And there are many other things that we can do that make us sick just because this, sin, this body is cursed. Because Adam and Eve sin, well, more so because Adam sin. And you can sit down and you can read a book and you can read to your heart's desires and you can push past the point till your eyes hurt. But if your eyes are hurting in that valley, you know that you brought upon yourself because you shouldn't have been reading that much. Let's face it, at this point in the game, we should know our bodies enough to know that there are some things we can do and some things we shouldn't do. And if we do them, they're going to make us sick. Some people might have too much sugar intake. And it's going to make them sick. They know this. Eating and drinking the wrong stuff can bring sickness. Pushing our bodies beyond the limits, whether it's looking at, staring at a computer screen. It could be a number of things. So when we look at sickness, and we look at the gifts of healing, what God was doing here was he was giving back to the church something that was lost in the garden. Man lost divine health. He lost that immortal body that was supposed to live on forever. And when we look at the gifts of healing, it is plural because there are all kinds of sicknesses. There are all kinds of diseases. A toothache is not the same as somebody who's broken a leg. And a broken limb is not the same as somebody who has lost a limb. There are all kinds of sickness. There are all kinds of diseases. But if we are living right, if we are confessing our sin, <coughs> healing is for us. Come, let us return to the Lord. He hath poured us. forgetting the rest of the verse, but basically he will build us up again. He will heal us. He will restore us. Anybody have And one last thing when it comes to healing. Healing is a work of faith. <coughs> but healing can be stopped by unbelief. At this point I need to stop. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? If not. Well, I think, you know, if I believe we would never sin, 